You sounded very professional. That's good because I didn't feel professional. <laughs> I felt like an idiot. I frequently do. Like in all my years of teaching environmental history, I've never made it to the environmental movement. It's not even in the syllabus. Which is tolerable. <laughs> or perhaps it's a strategic choice. Is the kicker there? Yeah. yeah. In class today, Bob was like, so we're not going to talk about it because we don't think they are middle of it. everyone. Uh, firstly, uh, wow, there's a lot of you. I was not expecting this, but clearly, wills and not the 10 points extra credit I'm giving people are why you're here, but hey, anyway. So, thank you very much for coming. Um, so today we're talking about a project I've been working on for a few years now. And basically, it's, I've written pages and pages and pages describing this project, but in a nutshell, it's look, I'm looking for educational related gifts and bequests uh, in French wills from the 14th and 15th centuries, okay, roughly that period. Now, you're kind of going, whoa, that's a really boring research topic, <laughs> okay. It's actually not, it's really, really, really exciting. And the reason why it's really exciting 
is because it tells us a lot about what people thought about education during this period and how they funded it. Another great thing about using wills as your source is that wills are written by normal people as well as really fancy pants aristocrats and nobles and fancy church people too. So you've got a lot of wills from a lot of different people from a lot of different backgrounds. Uh, in other words, we're actually going to get a glimpse of everyday people from the Middle Ages. That's pretty rare, okay? So to just give you an idea of what I'm going to talk about today, to begin with, I'm going to talk a good bit about medieval education. Most of you maybe don't know it in that much detail. I promise you, I will not take three hours to talk about it. I promise you. Uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about medieval wills, okay? What they looked like, what kind of people made wills, and so on. Uh, and then we're actually going to go into the educational legacies. We're going to look at the different uh, kinds of educational legacies we can find. And sometimes they're not obvious. Sometimes they don't look like they're an educational legacy, but they are, in fact, an educational legacy. And then we're going to do a little bit of a delve into two case studies, okay? One from Paris and one from Toulouse, which is in the south of France, okay? And um, they're both from the first part of the 15th century, all right? So they're kind of same period, completely different people involved, completely different social level we're talking about here. And then we're going to finish off with a little, like, reflection, okay? Uh, about why these legacies matter. Why should we care about them, okay? So, first off, let's talk about medieval education. And yes, I've got some really pretty pictures, okay? <laughs> so, most people, unfortunately, think that there were no schools in the Middle Ages. Education, learning, all of that wasn't important, okay? Now, if you came in here today and told that, well, that's okay, all right? But I'm gonna tell you a little story. A few years ago, I was introduced to an uh, extremely serious, senior, fancy pants medieval scholar. Like this person was, ooh, oh my gosh, I'm an expert. And so I said to him, you know, we were talking, and I was like, oh yes, and I do medieval education. And he turned around and, and he was like, I, he wasn't actually joking, because he said, oh, there were no schools in the Middle Ages. That's top medievalist, okay? So, yes, I'm going to take any opportunity I can to talk about medieval education, okay? Because it's really, really, really important. Uh, so there were lots of schools, and there was lots of different types of schools in later medieval Europe, for example. But it wasn't just in later medieval Northwestern Europe or Italy or stuff like that. It was all over the place. Um, and, and all of you are sitting in a medieval institution right now. Universities are medieval institutions. I know some days it kind of feels like that, but yeah, no. These are, you are sitting in a thing that evolved in the Middle Ages. How cool is that? And of course, education was valued way beyond Western Europe too. Uh, the Islamic world had lots of schools at different levels, and Jewish communities uh, put a high level of value on instruction and learning. Um, so what did medieval schools, what did a medieval education look like? Uh, now this is the really short version because I really mean it. I could talk about this for a very, very, very long time and I promise you I'm not going to do it. So uh, I'm just going to give you a little bit of the, the real experience of what meant to be in medieval education. So formal schooling, either you went to school or you went to a tutor, you got a tutor if you were wealthier, began around age seven, okay? Seven was that age. And of course it began when you think it's gonna begin and you began the way you think it's gonna begin. It began with learning your ABCs, okay? Begin with your ABCs. Then you move on to your syllabus, uh, uh, sorry, syllabus, no, <laughs> uh, uh, syllables, okay? And then you might try learning, or maybe even learning to sound out, looking at them written, as some basic prayers, like the Our Father and uh, the Hail Mary. Now, this, of course, is in, you know, Christian Western Europe, okay? 
then you would move on to something a little bit more complicated, like the distichs of Cato. Now, that was just a book of proverbs, okay? These kind of like ways to help you learn how to live well. And this was actually written in the late Roman uh, Empire. You might start reading Psalms. Then you would re move on to something a little bit more uh, difficult in terms of comprehen reading comprehension, but still entertaining for children, like Aesop's Fables. Yeah. And then, eventually, after several years, you would move on to heftier works from ancient Roman authors like Ovid and Lucan. Now, one thing to remember here is instruction was in Latin for the most part. It didn't matter where you are, whether you were learning to read in Dublin or London or Paris or Prague, you were learning it almost always in Latin. Uh, and there's a reason for this. Latin was the language of the church. It was also the language of government. It was also used in legal processes. And it was the language of educated people, okay? So you're, it was kind of like the lingua franca, the common language at this time. Anyone who was educated spoke Latin, so they could talk to each other. Now, there were schools that used local vernacular languages, especially when we come into the 14th and 15th centuries. Uh, now, these schools were usually more specific, more centered. Uh, they were uh, focusing on teaching pupils business practices, like rudimentary accounting, um, notarial skills, things like that. Now, the thing about, so I told you formal education began at seven. The problem is formal education doesn't really have an end date. It ends when it ends, okay? There are no, you know the way in uh, modern education, you're supposed to hit benchmarks at certain ages. That's not the way this works, okay? You learn the thing <coughs> when you've learned it, okay? It, and it was kind of interesting that you would actually take your time to learn these things, okay? And it wasn't like based on some construction of what you needed to do at a certain age. And of course, it was also based sometimes on how much money you had. How long could you stay in school, okay? So pupils might only go as long, uh, long enough to learn the basic prayers. Or they might stay in long enough so they've got a better grasp of the Latin language. They may not be very comfortable, but they could read some basic things, get involved in the Latin-based lit liturgy of church services, that sort of stuff. Or they might stay on. They might stay on through these elementary, uh, uh, this elementary education into grammar schools or grammar education until roughly the age of 14 when they, went, they could go to university. Yeah, they went to university at 14. I want you to all think of yourselves at 14. <laughs> yeah, disaster. Anyway, so I just want to draw your attention to this absolutely gorgeous image from um, uh, later 15th century Italy. And, ooh, look, it's got, even got a little uh, pointer there. And it's basically showing the story of uh, St. Augustine of Hippo, so from Roman North Africa, who, uh, this is him going to school. And this is him, of course, here we have the drop-off, the worried-looking parents. There's Monica, his mother, dropping off the son, looking very worried. And there he is again with the master. And yes, you've got some ideas about uh, medieval education here. It's actually cool. You've got their little books. They've, some of them have like a little like hard book where they just show, they have the, the alphabet here. He's actually learning the alphabet there. And in this case, yes, this child has been hung over someone else's back and getting spanked seriously, okay? Because yes, corporal punishment was a part of uh, education at this time. I really love this picture because it's a drastic rewriting of Augustine. Here's Augustine looking like, oh yes, I'm such a cutie pie. I'm never in trouble with the teacher. Actually, we know from Augustine's writings, he was always getting... Uh, uh, beatings at school because he was really bad at Greek, okay, and he was trying to learn Greek and he was really bad at it, and so he's kind of like, and he actually talks it like 20, 30 years, clearly was very traumatizing for him, so. Then we have universities. Now, universities were a product of the Middle Ages. They emerged roughly in the 12th century, 
and they focused on subjects such as grammar. And that was meant you were perfecting your grasp of Latin language and literature. Um, you focus on rhetoric, you might do rhetoric, so that's learning to read and speak persuasively. Now, you would have started that before you went to university, but these were like more advanced versions of this. You might attend classes on astronomy or mathematics or law, both secular law and church law, known as canon law. Um, medicine and the big most uh, important topics, the ones that the smartest of the smarty pants went to study was philosophy and theology. Okay. Now, what did going to university look like? Well, it actually kind of looked like what you're right here. <laughs> you know, this picture, you know, it's not that different to what you're, you're here. You've got your rows of seats. They're kind of sloped up at the back there. You've also, um, and so it meant sitting in lectures. The lecturer would, and the lecturer didn't like extemporate and make up random stuff like I might be doing right now. What they did was they read from a text. They would read a text. So if you were at a law lecture, you might, they might read from the corpus of civil law, okay? And as they read, they would stop and add comments or explanations or commentary along the way. And the students would sit and write and take notes. And they weren't just taking notes. What they were doing, they were basically making their own copies of these works, OK? And I just love this image because some things never change. This is an ethics lecture in Bologna. And yep, having a nice chat there in the back of the class. Someone's fallen asleep. Yeah, some things never change. So. How was all of this education organized? Well, for elementary and grammar schools, many were attached to religious institutions like churches, cathedrals, monasteries. But going to schools like those meant you often had a second musical focus because the boys and girls, if it was a convent school, had to partake in all those religious services as singers in the choirs. Now, I want you to keep this in mind for later. Because of this, most of these schools were actually free, okay, these, these choir schools, as we would call them. Um, and they were sometimes a great way for a poor boy with a good voice to get an education and start a career in the church, okay? And actually, several cardinals began as sons of fishermen, had a good voice, got into the choir at the local cathedral school, boom, ended up cardinal. And we're actually going to, I think I've found an example of this f uh, in one of our case studies. Um, but other elementary and grammar schools existed, and they were not directly ran by the church authorities. With the growth of cities and towns, plus great, their greater need to be literate for social advancement from the 13th century onwards, more independent schoolmasters and schoolmistresses begin to appear in the records. Uh, some had licenses from the local cathedral to teach. Others just took in a few pupils on the side. A lot of notaries did this, okay, to like augment their income. Um, sometimes you had itinerant schoolmasters moving from village to village to village to teach something. Um, by the 14th and 15th centuries, we also get city governments getting in on the game. And what they begin to do, they begin to create municipal schools, uh, they're employing schoolmasters directly. Now, this was a great way of attracting the best teachers who would, of course, end up teaching the sons of local elites. In other words, the people running the local municipal government. Yeah, they're, they're, it's really smart. Now, they did take in scholarship boys, that sort of stuff as well. So it's interesting to see these, this growth, explosion of these little schools and grammar schools and so on. Now, the one thing I do want you to be aware of is it didn't matter if a school was directly run by, the ch by a church or if it was an independent school mistress, or if it was a municipal school. They all taught the same kinds of texts. They used the same approach, all of this sort of stuff. So there was no, quote, religious slash secular education divide. That just didn't exist. 
It was all mixed together. Now, universities had a much more complex organisation. They often grew out of cathedral schools. Some of the earliest ones grew out of cathedral schools in the 12th century. And there was a strong church involvement right the way through. Most students and professors were considered members of the clergy, like minor clerics. Now, that begins to change, though, in the 14th and 15th centuries. And the university, actually, the word university comes from the word universitas, okay? And that means guild or union. So it's not actually about the buildings and the stuff like that. It's about the people. Universities are about the people gathered together to learn but they still need to be organized. So they were divided usually into faculties, okay? So such as the Faculty of Medicine, the Faculty of Canon Law, and so on. And most universities also had colleges. Now these colleges began as boarding houses for poorer students who would leave each day to attend the university lectures in various other locales. It might be at another college. Oftentimes they rented barns you know, nice big space for your lectures. Um, but these eventually become a kind of mini institution within the university under the umbrella of the university. Now, that's a kind of organization that you mightn't be all that familiar with or I mightn't be that familiar with, but that's actually how Oxford and Cambridge are still organized today, all right? But I'm leaving someone out. Who am I leaving out? The ladies <laughs> shouldn't leave us out, really. So, yes, fewer women w were uh, fewer women received formal education in the Middle Ages than men. We know this, but girls were still educated, and there was a whole load of reasons for that. So, if you're an aristocratic or royal woman, you still needed to have some level of education just to do your basic duties. You know, running a castle you know, having to correspond maybe about something. Yeah, you might have a secretary, but it's sometimes things were confidential. You needed to uh, convey that information just to yourself or from yourself. Lots of merchants and, and craftsmen had their daughters educated. That's because it usually resulted in a better marriage for those girls, all right? Uh, because if you could read and do arithmetic and stuff like that, you could help run any prospective husband's business, all right? So really important. And then finally, and this is for both men and women. This was uh, something applied regardless of gender, all right? Learning to read meant that you had the ability to read religious and devotional texts. And these became more commonly available and more easily available towards into the 15th century. Um, and so, becoming, at least getting some level of education, was good for the soul, all right? That was important. It actually helped you, helped save you, okay? Now, on the point of women, one of the famous examples that shows you that there were a lot more girls being educated at this time comes from the 1370s in Paris, and it shows that roughly one-third of all the licensed teachers in Paris at that time were women, one third. And they were actually only permitted to teach girls. So that meant that one third of all the official schools in Paris in the 1370s were girls' schools. Okay. So I've given you a lot of background in education <laughs> um, in somewhere like medieval France. So let's talk a little bit about wills. Okay. And yes, this is the kind of craziness I have to deal with. The great thing about medieval wills is that they're basically the same as modern wills. Uh, they're legal dis documents disposing of your worldly goods before you die. And so it's about basic things, you know, making sure your family are taken care of, settling debts, things like that. This is a really messy one from Toulouse, as you can see. Yeah. Um, there's two things I want you to keep in mind, though, when it comes to medieval wills, is that there's an explosion of will making in the 14th and 15th centuries in France. And there's a lot of reasons for that. And it's kind of they're all linked together in one big cycle 
um, there was an increase in literacy, but there was also an increase in a uh, more complex government system, more complex bureaucracy, more complex, complex legal systems and so on and so forth. So more people were making wills. If you owned really anything, if you had any kind of property, you had to really make a will to ensure that it transferred properly. And that's the second thing. Having a will became more and more essential if you had any property in debts. And so this means, and this is why this is such a cool, cool source, this means that relatively normal people who are usually missing from the historical record, they're in wills, they're making wills. We see them, okay? Um, and this is super exciting. So what did a medieval French will look like? Well, it looked like this, but we're not going to really look at this. I'm going to break it down to this handy little like, list of kind of the different sections of a will. Um, and so where are we going to find educational legacies in these kind of different sections of a will? Well, obviously, it's going to be in parental bequests and other bequests. You're kind of not surprised to see someone leaving money for someone to get educated in something like that, all right? Um, but lots of the educational bequests are actually found in pious bequests and burial and memorial arrangements. You're like, what does education have to do with your funeral arrangements, you know? Um, and this is actually pretty cool because these are one of these, it's a great thing because it reminds you that you might find some piece of historical evidence that doesn't look like it, it fits, or why is this uh, an educational thing? But if you know the context, you realize that it, is, it does fit. You see, medieval wills, much like modern wills, often include charitable donations, okay? And these were even more important for medieval Christians uh, because being charitable uh, giving a nice big gift meant that the recipients, be they individuals or institutions, would pray for your soul, okay, and help you get into heaven, all right? And also, charity was one of the good works, okay, and this becomes more and more important in the 14th and 15th centuries. This was an a w active way you could earn salvation. Now, I feel, and I'm really sad that none of the opera administration came today because I've got great, great advice, okay? Because I think modern university administrators should be taking some notes here. <laughs> oh, oh, you want to remember the history department in your will? <gasps> Not only will we put up an awesome plaque with your name on it, we will put in a good word for you with your deity of choice. <laughs> How awesome. Yeah, I'm like, I think they're missing a beat here. Yeah. So it's not surprising that there are edu educational legacies in medieval wills. All right? It's not. And they're kind of all over, scattered around. Um, and this is where I'm going to tell you a little story from my research and going on what it's actually like going to do research, and sometimes it's really scary, all right? So I was told by this, this person, top expert in archives in France, knows them inside out, and they told me, you know, there's a whole load of medieval wills in Toulouse, in the archives in Toulouse, and I was like, score. So I, you know, I put together, you know, funding applications, and I get some money, and I, put, and I arrive in France, this is a few years ago. This is pre-COVID times, okay? And it's Toulouse, it's lovely. I arrive and I'm like all geared up and I like go into the archives and all this. And they're like, well, actually, we've only, only got about 20 wills from before 1500. And I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> I panic. I go into panic for like a day. I'm like, where are they? And I'm looking through their lists. And of course, you know, if you're fresh into our archives, sometimes it takes you a while to figure out their system. And I'm like, oh my gosh, what is this? All right. So I take a breather. I go and look at my notes because I'd prepped all of this. And I was like, no, there's loads of wills. And then I realized that 
they did only have about 20 of these like what they call testament separé, so they're like individual wills, the, wi the wills that they would have been registered for something, okay, all right, or put into an archive or something. What they did have was dozens and dozens and dozens of books of notaries' records, like this one. These, these babies are thick. These are like that thick, some of them. They're like there, 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 they're huge. And this is basically what a notary, so a notary, much like we are here, you know, they're involved in drawing up legal documents and so on and so forth. So the, the notaries would, every single legal document they drew up, um, an agreement about a loan or transfer of property or anything like that, they would copy it into one of these books, all right? And if you were lucky, these books had a really nice like, list of contents. Mostly they didn't. And so I just spent three weeks turning pages. And any time I found the word testamentum, which is will, okay, I would take a photo of it and pull it up and, you know, all of this sort of stuff, okay? And I was really lucky. And I have found hundreds of wills. And I'm still working through it. And I just want you to acknowledge hundreds of anything, any type of record from the Middle Ages is crazy good. It's like, that's almost like modern, like good grief, you know, it's amazing. So let's talk a little bit about the different types of educational legacies I have found in my wills research. Now, I just didn't, I went to Toulouse, I've looked at stuff in Lyon, which is in the southeast of France, I've looked at stuff from Paris and the north of France, so yeah. I've got a fairly good idea of what's appearing in these. So I've actually divided these between what I call individual and institutional bequests. So these are the bequests that supported specific people, usually a family member, or those that were left to colleges, schools, or other institutions for the support of educational activities. So the first one is kind of obvious. It's kind of easy. It's a gift of money, all right? So an example uh, of this, I'm going to give you some examples as we roll through. Uh, and this is kind of like what you expect to find. So 1405 in Paris, Jean Quenard, who was the Bishop of Arras, so fancy, wealthy clergyman, um, gave 20 pounds, which might not seem like a lot, but was, uh, to one Jean Achat. And Jean Achat was his <coughs> um, a retainer, a servant, something like that, okay? And he said he gave it to him in order to send his son to school. Nice and easy. Clear, we know what's going on there. We maybe don't know what kind of school or whatever, but still, it's clear. It's definitely an educational legacy. But of course, money only gets you so far in education, as many of you understand. Gifts of books, okay? So... This is actually really a huge thing at this period. Uh, books were generally quite expensive. Um, and giving books for the purpose of education meant that a real barrier was lifted for prospective students. Because let's face it, hey, if you guys got a, like a laptop and free textbooks, going to beginning a year in college, that's a big, that's gonna make a big difference. And for some students, it's the difference between going to college and not going to college, all right? So this is a huge deal. So one example I'm going to give you is from Montpellier, which is in the south of France, on the Mediterranean, uh, from 1430. And a guy called Pierre Joberat, who was a priest and hermit, uh, left his godson, who was also called Pierre, um, a large selection of books and two separate gifts. So the first set of books that little Pierre got were books for grammar to help him with his grammar education. So probably, and then the second set of books he wasn't allowed to get until he was 16, all right? So that would suggest A, that he's younger than 16 when he got, when this happened, probably maybe 10, 14. Uh, and the books he got out, he was gonna get after he was 16 were for university stuff, university-level type textbooks. Um, 
One of the most common type of educational uh, legacies was uh, maintenance. So this is actually the most common one. Legacies are requests to maintain someone at a school or university without stipulating an amount. Uh, so a good example of this is from Lyon in 1364. And firstly, yes, this is a will of a woman. This, her name was uh, Jeannette de Bois, de Bois, sorry. Um, fa and she was the wife of a dyer, so someone who dyed clothes. And uh, she requested that her heirs maintain one Leonard de Bois, her nephew and illegitimate son of her late brother in school until he was 18 years of age. So she is, that's actually a big chunk, because that's like, it's not stipulating an, only as an amount. It's like, you are going to support him right the way through until he's 18. You know, food, lodgings, everything. School, everything. Um, a kind of sad case actually comes from Paris in 1411. Uh, Jean de Berck, he was a prosecutor in the royal courts in Paris. Uh, he was broke when he made his will. Uh, his will was basically about him settling his debts. All right. And he had to beg his sons-in-law in his will to help maintain his son Jacquette in school, quote, as he has had no legacy of his own from either his father or mother. So sometimes it was like really throwing people on the mercy of people, but you know. Institutional legacies actually follow the same pattern, all right? Um, you've got gifts of money. It's nice and clear, okay? Uh, so, for example, in Lyon, at some point in the 14th century, it's not uh, dated, Yvernal de Montpellier, what a great na name, uh, left quite a chunk of change to 12 poor scholars at the Greater Grammar School at Lyon. So probably boys around 10 to 14 years of age you're looking at here. Um, in exchange for their prayers, okay? Um, as well as a nice legacy to the master of the same school. Now, this money, of course, is going to be used for practical things, all right? It's going to be used to help maintain these uh, pupils at school through bursaries or providing food or lodging or whatever. But those students are going to pray for Ivernal and help his soul get into heaven. Everyone wins, okay? Um, now, the next one, someone may balk at this. This is a very modern term. <laughs> development, development funds? What is this, business class? No, yeah. So, I've called them this because this is where we get people giving money for the long-term future of an educational institution. So, in Paris in 1399, Arnaud de Corby, he was the Chancellor of France which means he was a top person in the royal government. So not short of Bob or two. And he left a thousand gold francs. That's, uh, we'll talk a little bit about money in a little while. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. He left it to the scholars of the College of Cholet in order to augment their bursaries, specifically in order to invest in property to provide an income for the college. That's a very modern kind of investment practice. And this is, you, this is done in modern universities where donors give or leave money or property to help maintain a college or university in the long term, therefore adding to their endowment fund. The car scholarship, a lot of you know the car scholarship, okay? The car foundation scholarships are an example of this right here at Angelo State. Okay, that's kind of cool. It's got a long history. Okay. Another thing is, of course, gifts of books. All right. Churches, colleges, and university faculties often had libraries. They were often very, very small. Okay. Maybe only a couple of dozen books. Uh, so legacies of books were always appreciated. In Paris in 1410, Pierre d'Auxon, he was the uh, physician to the king. All right. Uh, he left a cash donation to the Faculty of Medicine at Paris, so clearly to his alma mater, all right? And, and, and they had to celebrate a mass for him annually, 
okay, after he died, so, you know, prayers, and a specific book by Galen, who was an ancient authority on medicine to the same faculty. So I'm sure that textbook was greatly appreciated. And the final institutional legacy I want to talk about is um, choir boys and their masters. Now, these were what I call combo legacies. They're usually involved, uh, these choir boys are usually involved in the funerals and memorial services of the testator, the person making the will. So the gift was a kind of payment for their performance, okay? Uh, since they were involved in all of these services, they were involved in praying for the soul of the testator. And the prayers of innocent young children were seen as particularly effective. So, yeah, because they're innocent, you know, so maybe God's going to listen to them rather than us terrible old people, you know. Um, monies left to them were often used to help fund their living expenses while being instructors in things like music and Latin and so on and so forth. Or there's some evidence to suggest that some of these monies were put aside and turned into a kind of education savings account, all right, where when the boys, when their voices broke, all right, they would, they kind of had to figure out a new way for themselves. So oftentimes this money was used to help pay for them if they wanted to go on to further education outside the cathedral or church. So there were loads and loads and loads of educational legacies lurking around in medieval wills. But I wanted to talk about two case studies that shows the kinds of people who are making wills and the kind of people who are thinking about education. And the first one is pretty obvious. Okay, so let's go on a little journey. Oh yes, and we're going to start in Paris. And we're going to zoom in to Paris. Okay, and our first case study is that of Jean de Neuilly Saint Fond. All right. Now he's an interesting person. We don't know a huge amount about him, but he was a very prominent advocate or lawyer at the courts of the uh, justice in Paris. He eventually became a canon or senior clergyman at Notre Dame Cathedral, and there you see it there, all right? And he was really, really involved in several Parisian colleges. He seems to have acted as a kind of a legal counselor to some of them, legal advisor, um, and his wills show someone who is deeply interested in education. So, he leaves gifts of money to the schoolmasters and choir boys involved in his funeral and memorial services in several churches in Soissons. And I'm just going to go back here. Soissons is here. And he seems to have came from, based on his last name, that's the village he came from, he came from just below Soissons. So we'll talk about that in a moment. So he also left a gift of money to each each of the students at the College of Préel in Paris, that was part of the university system there, he left the College of Préel 500 écus in rents. So what that means is property that they would get the rent from. Now, I want to put that into context because 500 écus, what, what does that mean, you know? So 500 écus was more than 10 times the annual income a master craftsman, such as a master mason or carpenter, could earn in a year. So I want you to think about a top plumber, okay? What they might earn in a year and then multiply that by 10. That is a chunk of change, all right? And that's only one of his bequests, all right? He was very affluent and he spent, he gives a lot of it to education. He left, <coughs> he left lots of books to both the College of Prael and the College of Dormant Beauvais, um, mainly on civil law. Obviously, he was a lawyer, so that's not surprising. Uh, and these would have been useful to the students. He left books to the pupils at Saint Nicolas in Soissons, which was also in the city northeast of Paris. Uh, and these were all books aimed at grammar, so that lower level of education. All right. And at the end of the will, he stated that a quarter of whatever was left, which was a lot, uh, should go also to the College of Prael. Um, as we can see, these schools, 
and colleges benefited materially from the generosity of someone like Jeanne de Neuilly saint fond And it's likely that he was an alumnus of all of these institutions, all right? We don't really know anything about his early life, but the way he goes into such detail um, in his educational bequests and how they move from choir boys to a grammar school in Soissons and then to university colleges in Paris, were these the places he went to school? Was he one of those poor choir boys who had a good voice and just used that as a springboard into a very successful career? And it also makes me wonder, is he trying to provide for those who are just like him, all right? Uh, who might use this e educational career to become a successful lawyer just like him? Now, fun fact, as I was doing all the research for this, actually I was looking for images for this, um, I discovered a really cool thing. Uh, I discovered that one of the books that Jeanne de Neuilly saint fond donated to the College of Dormont Beauvais is still around, okay? We still have it. It's actually in a library in Switzerland, okay? And this is one of the books he donated. How cool is that? Come on, yeah. Um, and yeah, it's in, in Switzerland. Um, so let's move out of Paris. So we're in Paris, we're going to zoom out, and we're actually going to go to the south. We're going to go to Toulouse, or more specifically, to just south of Toulouse, all right? So, and we're gonna look at our second case study, and that is Jacques Calvé complete opposite of Jeanne de Neuilly saint fond Bit of a mouthful, but yeah. So Jacques was a laborer. That's what he's listed as in his will. Now, which meant he was a peasant. Uh, fairly well-to-do successful peasant, all right. Um, and we can tell this from his will. He left several gifts to local churches you know, to help them, like one is to help them with renovations and stuff like that. And they're not huge gifts, but they add up. When you add them all together, you're like, oh, this guy was doing pretty well for himself. Um, but he's still a peasant, okay? So he's still like towards the end, uh, lower part of the socioeconomic structure. He also left his door, each of his daughters, several grandchildren, other relatives, a quarter golden franc each. Another of these like pieces of money that doesn't really mean anything. You know what you could get for, uh, sorry, a half franc each. You know what you could get? You could get a, mil a good milk cow. Not just any milk cow, a good milk cow or two to three pigs. That's not, I don't know how many, of, how many of you know anything about the price of, you know, cows at the moment. That's, a, that's pretty good, all right? Um, and he gives several of these, all right? Um, his principal heir was his eldest son, Bernard, but he had a younger son, Jean. And he instructed his elder son, Bernard, to maintain his younger son, Jean, in school for three years for the purpose of becoming a cleric. So, a priest, cleric, whatever. Now, if Jean, there was a whole load of, of course, there's, it's a will, so there's all, all sorts of, like, they have to think about what ifs. If Jean did not become a cleric, he would receive his half of the estate grant. If Jean did become a cleric, Bernard would pay him a pension and cover his lodgings for a completely undetermined amount of time. So the older brother would have to like basically give him this nice pension for the rest of maybe his life. That could be a lot more than half that... Uh, that um, <clears throat> uh, part of the estate. So this is actually really important. So it tells us that peasants are sending their children to school, and it tells us that Jeanne is already in school. All right, he is already in school. Uh, it also tells us that the family, though peasants, though laborers, were able to spare his labor. Remember, this in these societies, you could everyone was contributing to the household, all right? So they have enough money or they think that education is important enough that they're going to spare his labor. Um, 
And of course, this is legally setting in stone that Bernard would continue to support Jean if he became a cleric. So why spend all of this money? You see, having a priest or cleric in the family, like a deacon, even if you weren't a full priest, if you were some other part of the clergy, that was a major status symbol, major status symbol. It increased a family's visibility, especially locally, all right? And that person who had been sent off into the clergy could become a patron, could open doors for other members of the family, you know? And also, it showed the piety of the father, of Jacques, and the whole family, that they were willing to, you know, help this person become a member of the clergy, to enter God's service. Now, I think I've given you a lot of cool information today. <laughs> it's really interesting and it's exciting because it lets us know so much about normal people. But we always have to answer this question. So what? What's the, like, you know, what does it matter? What is the significance of these educational legacies? What can they tell us about life and people in the Middle Ages? And, well, really, why should we care about it today? So let's talk about significance, all right? Um, so firstly, in the 14th and 15th centuries, lots and lots of people were making wills, from nobles to important lawyers and members of the clergy, to craftsmen and their wives, to laborers. And they give us a glimpse of real people, normal people, and what they thought was important. Because what you put in your will, this is your last will and testament. It's like your last worldly act in many ways. What you're putting in that means it's something you think is important. And uh, what did they think was important? Education, yeah. Yeah, yeah they really thought it was important. Um, if people could afford to send their children and relatives to school, if they could afford to support colleges and faculties and all of this sort of stuff, they did. They put that money aside for that. This means that education and schooling was seen as important in so many ways. It was seen as important spiritually. It was seen as an important way to advance you and your family economically and socially. Secondly, these wills tell us that giving, you know, wealthy people giving to educational institutions has a really long history. The only difference now is that most donors aren't, or at least they aren't directly, thinking about the salvation of their souls. All right? And then finally, and this is coming back to our title of today, which was From Beyond the Grave. People, medieval or otherwise, wanted to keep helping after they were gone. Uh, legacies like these educational ones gave these people agency, a kind of afterlife in their communities and families without the zombie vibes, okay? Mm -hmm. So, all good. Um, and this is actually really important because it meant they were able to continue to help their families advance through society, make a living, and they were able to help, uh, and those institutional gifts that they gave helped generations of pupils and students to learn. So, wrap up there, and we'll say thank you. All right. <laughs> So I think we have some time for questions. All right. So it's okay. Oh yes. Uh, yeah, I was actually curious how some of these walls were legally binding because uh, you, you can contest walls nowadays, and some of the requests in there would seem pretty contestable. Like, uh, like how did you? Yeah, I think it's no different than today. For the most part, people because it was legally bound, binding, people had countersigned. There was executors, all of this sort of stuff. There was a whole process to ensure that people 
were doing what they were supposed to do. Now, it, invariably, much like today, if someone gets money, they can just decide, oh, well, I'm not going to give it and stuff like that. So I'm sure there was an element of that going on. But I think much like most people today with wills, they just do what they're told in it, you know? All right? Yeah. But I, I, it's an interesting thing. Yeah. Yes. Um, so <laughs> because that was my area of study, you know. So uh, my first book was on uh, elementary and grammar education in late medieval France in Lyon, okay? So that's in the southeast of France. And that's when I discovered, oh, look at these wills. Oh, they have educational legacies in them. So I put that to one side and then I came back and it's because, so there's a couple of things to keep in mind when you're doing research, all right? You need to think about languages, all right, I could do the Latin, I could do the French. All right, so where am I going to go? <laughs> France, okay? Another thing is you need to find somewhere that actually has the stuff, all right? Ireland, for example, almost nothing remains in our medieval holdings. That's because it was blown up, all right? Yeah, in the early 20th century, yeah. So... I need to go somewhere else. So I decided to do France instead, all right? And they actually have lots and lots. You have to go where the sources are. That often guides your research decisions, all right? You can't go to where there's nothing, all right? Yeah, yeah. Yes? Well, you could be a big money saver because then you wouldn't have to send your children out to be educated. At least that's the basic thing, them. because you could educate them. And so yeah. did a lot of people do that? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, and then the other one was, um, so the teachers at like the all-girls school, mm -hmm. like there was no men at all? No. Um, most, now this is really interesting. <laughs> all right. So. A lot of these schools were what we would call single sex schools, you know, you know, boys were in one, girls in another. It wasn't necessarily strictly known, smaller area, like smaller towns, uh, so outside of Paris, you know. Boys and girls are being educated together. Uh, there's a French poet called Jean Fossat. He's famous. He wrote a big chronicle of the Hundred Years' War and all of this sort of stuff. He also wrote poetry. And in some of his poems, he, like, remembered being a child and he remembered, like, uh, playing with the little girls who were also in his class at school and like buying them like little like like bits of fruit and stuff like that as treats you know very cute so there were some mixed schools for sure but that you definitely see those in the smaller villages and stuff like that in the bigger towns they were usually no and um, those particular ones the church the the schools that were licensed uh, that had these like licensed schoolmasters or schoolmistress like in Paris. No, the, none of them were free. Only the cathedral schools and some of the um, the, the church related schools would have been free. Did all oh. the girls go to that school? No, no, no. Had That's the thing. You had, to be you had to be a boy. All right. For the girls, you could go into a convent school, but invariably those were really aristocratic girls who went into those. All right. So there wasn't a lot of awkward mobility for girls through that. Yeah, good question. Yeah. Oh, someone. So we'll sit, take. Yeah. Uh, why do you think there's so many women who have not been taught education in medieval times? Because people are like the when you when I say the word medieval, what do you think? Like dragons and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Archer just said dark ages. No. Yeah. Any of you who've taken my Western Civ one know how much I hate this so much. Yeah, I think it's because honestly, there's a whole like I'm not going to go into because there's a lot I could talk about. But basically, it's because it's a twofer. The Renaissance people were like, oh, we're go like people in like 15th and 16th century, uh, or 14th, 15th century people actually in the Middle Ages is one way of looking at it. They were like, oh, everything's useless. We just want to like read Cicero. And like everything between Cicero and me, because that was definitely how Petrarch felt about these things, uh, he was like, everything else is useless, you know. And there were 
dark and dirty, and this was exacerbated in the 19th century uh, with this idea that the Middle Ages were useless and did, that nothing happened in the Middle Ages. There was no developments, nothing. And that's just patently untrue, you know? And it's because, the, it's because people ignored it. And yeah, there's some like issues, especially in the early Middle Ages with documentary sources. So we don't have, so initially when they used the phrase dark ages, they meant there isn't as much sources on this, but then it became this pejorative thing, you know? And like, just even think of like Samuel L. Jackson saying, I'm gonna get medieval on you. And it's like, yeah, it's this <laughs> idea of violence and all of this sort of stuff. And it's ridiculous and it's untrue or certainly no more true for the Middle Ages than any period of history, including our own. You know? Yes? Um, what was one of the most interesting conclusions that you came to, even if you didn't expect to see? Okay, so I didn't get to talk about this so much, but I referenced it. Um, there's a whole bunch of wills from Lyon, so from this, uh, in and around Lyon, so that's the southeast of France, that where the educational legacies are being directed at illegitimate children. Okay, and th I think that's really interesting because what that's telling us is those children may not have had a legal right to uh, property, okay, like houses, farms, lands. They may not have had legal property to stuff that was like passed down through quote unquote the family line, but their parents and family members and so on and so forth still wanted to help them out and still wanted to give them a career, all right, and so they would give them money to help them go, th that was money they could give them. That was like, they could ask the estate to just keep them in school until they were ready to like find some employment, that sort of stuff. That's one of the big things that I really enjoyed finding. Um, and I have so much more to say on that, but I'm not going to. Um, another thing that I really found interesting was there is a s collection of wills from Saint Quentin, which is in, uh, we'll say Northwest. Of France. And there's about 50 wills in this collection. And there's only three educational legacies. Okay. There's only, there's only three wills with educational legacies. All three of those wills are wills of women. What does that, I'm not sure if I'm ready to make conclusions about that, but that's just a really interesting thing. Yeah. Good. Excellent. Any questions? Dr. Who? This is a long enough time period. Did you find that there was a specific time frame where there was like an increase in kind of wills toward education, or is this sort of a across the board? This is really regular. This is very regular. This is like, like uh, some of the earliest ones that I've seen are from like 1305, 1310, so they're early. There's actually an early one, one of those San Quentin ones uh, that was from like the 11, eight, the 1280s, you know? Mm -hmm. I don't go back any further because I have to like, I have to put some limits on my stuff. And it's just like, it's, it's regular. You're seeing these pop up constantly throughout the period. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, yes. I haven't seen that, and you have to be real careful about that, because technically speaking, it's not legal. Well, yeah, they did it, <laughs> but, but it wasn't legal. That was uh, nepotism, um, and so sometimes they might necessarily say that in like a legal document, because that might be a little bit more under the table, like more of a head nod understanding with the, the church, you know, oh, little Jimmy, you know. He, he'll get my, you know, position in the chapter when, you know, he's ready, you know. Yeah, the head nod, you know. But they might, ne they might necessarily, they wouldn't put it necessarily in. Right. Yeah. But I'm sure they did, just verbally. Yes. Who's next? Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Was there anyone? No, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Was there just any, just a fun little like you just came across, like, this page just belongs to me and me alone, no one else can have it, and I just keep that. Yeah, it. there was one, and I was supposed to look it up again, and it's like, is he leaving money to his prostitute? <laughs> <laughs> and I have to, I'm going to have to circle around about that again, but it's like, it's really like, yeah, I'm not, I'm still not sure about that one. Yeah. 
<laughs> but hey, you know, that was nice of him. You know? yeah. Yes. Um, it's pretty standard. It's, it, it's, it's slowly growing through the whole period, all right, um, <coughs> as people, more people are making wills and so on and so forth. But I would say even just in, like, if you take one part of, like, Lyon in the, <coughs> in the um, um, southeast of France, I did see a big rise in that period. You know, people seeing it happen, like making a will just to be on the safe side, all of this sort of stuff. I, I see that uh, more, and people were more. And then that, of course, the Black Death actually resulted in more and more people thinking about their death, even if they survived. And this went on for over a century and more, where people are like sitting down, like trying to plan out how they're going to die, you know, because it could happen any time and stuff like the Black Death might mean you know, if the bubonic plague struck again, which it did repeatedly every five to 10 years, you could be in trouble, you know, so you need to be always like, you know, making your peace. All right, good, excellent. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, well, the laborer. Yeah, there's actually several. I was really surprised how many, you know, fairly normal people are making wills, all right? Basically, if you had property, and so it didn't have to be an awful lot. You might have to just write, like, a few lines, you know. But they never did because they were trying to get their money's worth, you know. And, like, when I was saying about the different parts of the will, a whole section of the beginning of the will is commending your soul to God and stuff like that, you know. So it's, it, that's something that everyone would have wanted. Uh, and then you definitely see normal people making these wills. And that's why they're so exciting. Okay, because you're seeing so many different people, like usually with medieval documents, medieval sources, you're seeing the hoity-toity people, you know, the people who have money and so forth. So I have a lot of money, who have power, all of this sort of stuff. The great thing about wills is that you can go down into society and it's not just, another way you can find out is court cases, criminal things. But I'm like, you know, can we just, can we, can we have a look at people who are not criminals, you know? <laughs> uh, so, you know, so it's nice to see, you know, because of course that might be a self-selecting sample. Uh, but, you know, you want, it's great to see that. And that's what's so exciting about this. And of course, illegitimate children are often missing from records. So these are also good. Great. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Were there ever uh, people who would maybe will, want to will, and then they would have a scribe write down that for them? Yes, that's exactly. We have no indication that Jacques was literate, Jacques Calvé, none whatsoever, okay? Because he might have, the notary was the trained person who would write this down. Jacques might say, well, I want to give, you know, enough for my daughter, you know, Margaret to buy a cow, you know, and the notary would do that, you know, and it would be, and the, so there, because there was a specific type of language, even wealthy people wouldn't have drawn up their own wills, because they're a special legal document, you need to write it in a certain way, and you yourself, like the same way as today, you've got notaries, and notaries public, you know, they have specific training and specific licenses that allow them to do that. Um, honestly, yeah, I've, Jacques probably wasn't literate, you know, if you're going to make that. So it's interesting because some of the people making wills and some of the people making wills, of course, for, with educational legacies are themselves not educated. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like these, like, these books are all the same handwriting. Right. Each one is like, you know, it's the same notary over and over again, you know. And it's really cool. And sometimes they put their little like 
if you have the proper like will, like the, the separated will, they'll have their little like, they have their own little like symbols that they draw and stuff like that, that's theirs. Uh, I don't often get like seals, like wax seals for these kinds of documents because these just weren't necessarily, I think for some of the like royal wills or something like that, you might get that, but not really for uh, most people's wills. You know, so this is how people made their mark. And sometimes you have the signature of the person who's giving the money. And sometimes you have a really shaky like X. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, to mark. Yeah, so probably someone who isn't literate. Yeah. So when you go to transfer the Sufis archives, do you actually do any of the analysis of it there, or do you just get pictures? Like you can't control as to who John looks to. Yeah, sometimes, like, honestly, so the f when I did research in France, when I was doing my PhD, I did a lot more of the analysis in the archives, because I was there for two years, okay? So I was able to sit down and, like, take my time and just process it. Um, now, it's kind of like a smash and grab operation. You're going in with your camera going, you know, at, by the end of those three weeks in Toulouse, because I was looking for specific abbreviations, because of course, they don't just write the words in medieval documents. They use abbreviations right the way through. It's maddening. And I began having these stress dreams about this specific abbreviation <laughs> for the word testamentum, okay? <laughs> over and over and over, you know, and it was like, because literally I was going through these, and like I'm talking, like some of the books, no, not a single test, well, some of them, 20, you know, um, and so you're going in and you're taking photographs and you're taking multiple photographs and yeah, and, and of course in these archives you can only get, like in the, the smaller archives, you can only get so many documents per day, you know, so it's like, it's a whole process. And then I was supposed to go this summer. That did not happen. No. No. COVID, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any other questions? Yes. This will be my last question. I kind of want to touch on the uh, education part. Yeah. Back in the old, uh, you know, because uh, science is at the time not the most spectacular, especially with the health department, like the health regard. Uh, what was like some of the stuff that they taught like uh, show us a moral bar if you had to get uh, an arrow in the say your arm you'll be fine well firstly I'm not an expert in medieval um, <laughs> medicine um, and you're you've cited a difficult thing there yeah. because are you going to go to a physician or a barber type surgeon for an arrow in the that that might be somebody who's a surgeon and a physician are different mm -hmm. okay that's the first thing. Uh, interesting enough, this differentiation is still used in different titles in the UK and Ireland. Like um, doctors are doctors, physicians, uh, but surgeons are m called Mr. or Mrs. Interesting enough, yeah. Fun fact there. So um, one of the, thi the different things they would teach, one of the problems was uh, and people are like, oh, it's because medieval people were stupid. It's because no one knew about this stuff until like the 17th, 18th, 19th century. And people were still doing this in the 19th century. And guess what? Some people are still doing it today. So humoral theory, humoral, the idea that the body is like four different humors, you know, um, that was based on Galen and stuff like that from the ancient Greek period. And that was used everywhere. You know, and the whole idea that if you have a fever or infection, so usually you have, yeah, you are going to bleed. They're going to cut you and bleed out your blood so to cool you down because you've got an excess of blood and that's what's making you hot. And you're kind of thinking this is stupid, but it's not. It's actually weirdly, like, it's messed up, but it's really, really good in showing you kind of how you figure these th things out without the kind of modern measurement techniques that we have today. Now, the thing is, that's cupping, you know, to take that. Uh, how many athletes today are cupping? You know, they're doing that cupping thing where they, like, pull out the toxins from the skin. It's basically the same thing, all right? So we tend to mock these medieval people, but 
just turn to some parts of the internet and it's right there, all right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, you've got all sorts of, uh, th there's all sorts of things taught and a lot of it was just they're reading through these texts and learning it. Um, there's, there's a lot, you know, and actually they were pretty scientifically advanced. One of the things they're really good at uh, developing are things uh, based on astronomy and mathematics. Like after all, the astrolabe, which was the most important, uh, you know, invention for navigation was developed in, well, what was actually perfected in what? 11th century Spain, uh, uh, Islamic Spain, you know. So they're really up on some stuff, you know. We kind of dismiss them, but no. Like um, actually m medieval people were often much more interested in um, mechanics and mechanical solutions for everyday problems than ancient uh, uh, Greeks or Romans. And that's because the ancient Greek and Roman economies tended to base themselves on slave labor. And they had millions and millions of slaves they could use. Whereas in the Middle Ages, they still had slaves, but there was a lot less people. So they needed to come up with ways around it. And so they actually were, it's been argued that they were more mechanically advanced uh, than um, Romans, for example. Okay. So, any other questions? Yes. So, I guess just looking, uh, so looking back on say you're talking about Vegas and the college in uh, the medieval mm -hmm. era, how, how did that, did it have every, did you find like any similarities between being a college student back then versus now, or the differences? <laughs> I'm kind of laughing because I could make a lot of bad jokes at this point, but I won't. <laughs> uh, but like, uh, even how you're seated right now, just like the physical space you're in here. Like I know it's a theater, but it's the same idea, you know? Like I, I, I wouldn't go back through all the images, but yeah, it's that same idea. You've, uh, there's a nickname for it. It's kind of pejorative nowadays, but the sage on the stage, <laughs> you know? I'm not a sage, but I'm on a stage, you know? But it gives you an idea, like you, your experience, your physical experience is actually really like a medieval experience right now. So I know here at Angelo State, we tend to have rather small classes, you know, smaller classes, uh, but in many other universities, especially in the UK and Ireland and in continental Europe, they have these huge lecture theatres. I remember my first class in um, history in University College Dublin many moons ago was in a 500 person lecture theatre. And then, of course, you'd break down and have seminars each week, you know, tutorials, as we call them. But it's, it's, a, it, it's much more like that medieval feel, even, you know? And a lot of the, like, the way places like Oxford and Cambridge are actually organized is like, wow, it's medieval. You know, they're still got, and it's, it's kind of hard to organize sometimes because is someone employed by a college or the faculty or the university? Any other questions? These are great questions, by the way. I'm loving them. No? No? Well, I'd just like to thank you all for your time, your attention. You are a fantastic audience, and I'll see some of you. Oh, sorry? Oh, and if you're Dr. McMillian's students, don't forget to come up and sign that you came so you can get your extra credit. All right. Well, thank you so much. You have a great rest of the evening. Bye.